Good afternoon. Um, I'm David Porter from the University of Pennsylvania. Thank the organizers uh, very much for the invitation to be here. It's been a fascinating morning so far. Um, we've, uh, hopefully this may be um, straightforward and easy. We've heard a lot about CAR T cells um, this morning, and uh, part of what I was asked to do was to give a sense of some of the strategies uh, of personalized cell therapy that we've used and what kind of lessons we can take home. We've heard a lot about this this morning, and um, maybe I can apply some of that to uh, the discussion here. Um, these are my disclosures. I think the most relevant is that I and my team at the University of Pennsylvania um, have licensed the technology I'm going to talk to you about uh, to Novartis, uh, who is moving forward with development, and that's all managed through the University of Pennsylvania. <clears throat> We've seen a lot about this. There are a number of different uh, methods for adoptive cell therapy. We heard a lot about uh, TIL therapy, which is here in the um, bottom panel. One can think about adoptive cellular therapy with T cell receptors, and what I'm going to talk to you about is manufacturing CAR modified T cells, chimeric antigen receptor modified T cells. And certainly I believe, and, and, and I'm sure uh, many others, that, that this targeted cellular immunotherapy is going to be able to overcome many of the limitations we think about with conventional modalities of therapy. And we've heard a lot of this this morning. Using these genetically modified T cells that now have this redirected specificity, we can, we can um, uh, use some of the advantages that we look for with antibody therapy. We will have specificity because these T cells are now targeted via an antibody motif. And part of the theme of what I'm going to talk to you about is that this is a living drug. And as a living drug, if you will, cellular therapy responses can be amplified. These cells can grow in the body. And any response we may get can be magnified as the cells grow. In addition, since this is a living product, they can last for long periods of time. And if they survive and they last, it can provide ongoing vaccine-like activity. <clears throat> We chose to start by targeting CD19. Um, CD19 is, is low-hanging fruit on some level. We know that expression is generally limited to, to normal B cells and some B cell precursors. It is expressed on just about every B cell malignancy, and importantly, it is not on a hematopoietic stem cell. So there really is no risk of marrow aplasia and very low risk of other off-target toxicities. And we are genetically modifying the T cells with a chimeric antigen receptor. I apologize if this is a review for everybody, but as we recall, a chimeric antigen receptor has, has three parts, right? It has an antigen binding domain that is external to the cell, a hinge or intracellular region, and then a stimulatory and preferably a co-stimulatory domain internal to the cell. Those signals are, are critically important for activation, growth, and survival. It may actually be that the co-stimulatory domain is more critical for things like survival and expansion, uh, though that remains to be worked out. In the work that I'm going to talk to you about, this is our construct. We use the CD3 zeta chain for signaling in the 41BB co-stimulatory domain. <clears throat> and really, the technology is, is shown here in this cartoon. A chimeric antigen receptor has that antigen recognition domain of an antibody with the intracellular signaling domains. And using gene transfer technology, in our case we use a lentiviral vector, we can stably express the CAR on the surface of a T cell, conferring novel antigen specificity. So you see the infection with the lentivirus, uh, genetic material is inserted directing expression of this new molecule transported to the cell membrane, now allowing it to recognize CD19 when it couldn't before, hopefully leaving behind a dead tumor cell. So that's really the bottom line of this technology. And the clinical trials, we, we saw this um, briefly are shown here. A patient comes in, they undergo leukophoresis for a steady uh, state T cell collection. The cells are activated and infected with a lentiviral vector containing the gene of interest, in this case, uh, the, the chimeric antigen receptor against CD19. They are activated and expanded ex vivo. 
We use magnetic beads to activate them. The beads are removed, leaving behind a genetically modified T cell product. In most cases, the patient will receive immunosuppressive or lymphodepleting chemotherapy and then receive their T cell infusion. This can all be done as an outpatient should the patient be able to be an outpatient. This entire process right now takes about 14 days. Um, this is being uh, uh, modified fairly extensively with the hope of moving this process down to five to seven days. <clears throat> now, when we started this, we started by doing um, a, a pilot trial in patients with relapsed and refractory CLL. We did not start with a traditional phase one dose escalation study, um, in part because this is a living drug. And while we knew a reasonable dose to start with from some animal model studies, um, we didn't really think a traditional phase one study was appropriate. Um, inclusion exclusion criteria have all been published, um, but basically we tried to select patients who had a very poor prognosis and had, had a life expectancy of less than two years. When we um, started this, we estimated um, of um, well, we said that patients had to have failed at least two prior therapies. They had to have relapsed within two years of their last therapy. We initially treated 14 patients. We saw complete remissions in four, partial remissions in another four. The overall response rate was 57%. One of the issues was that the doses we gave patients varied by up to two logs, though the cells did expand rather dramatically, and so this led to a second follow-up study where we did a, a essentially a dose optimization trial, a randomized phase two trial of two dose levels, both of which induced complete remissions in our pilot trial. And then there was a follow-up period for the dose level we picked. So this, is, this goes to a little bit of the trial design that we were talking about this morning. This is not really the traditional uh, trial design development that we think of. I just put together the 43 patients who are valuable for response just to give you a sense of, of the magnitude of activity. Um, we have seen a quarter of these patients, 26%, achieve complete remissions. These are complete remissions by every measurement, including deep sequencing and bone marrow specimens. No patient who had a complete response has relapsed. It's another common theme of immunotherapy that we heard about this morning. 23% had a partial response or overall response rate in patients with heavily pretreated relapsed refractory CLL was just under 50%. <clears throat> this gives you a sense of the magnitude of the response. I'm um, not trying to teach you how to read bone marrow specimens, but to suffice it to say, the uh, marrow here on the left panel is extensively infiltrated with CLL. By 31 days after one T cell infusion, this patient is in complete remission with no evidence of CLL by any measure. By, by standard histology, flow cytometry, cytogenetics, and even deep sequencing of uh, DNA samples. And this can eradicate even bulky disease. We did some um, uh, detailed calculations on our first three patients. And we were able to calculate, based on their, their bulk of disease and marrow involvement, that these cells eradicated somewhere between about three and seven and a half pounds of tumor cell. It really was quite potent. These cells expanded rapidly and to very high levels. What this is showing you on the, on the um, uh, bottom panel is uh, flow measurement for CART-19 CAR-modified T cells. What you can see is by day eight, these cells already represent 58% of all the CD3 positive T cells, or in fact, all the CDA positive T cells. By day 10, they represent almost 80% of all the CDA positive cells, and you can see them starting to contract by day 28. This is coincident with eradication of the CLL, which you see in the upper panel. It represented about 42% of all the uh, mononuclear cells. By day 8, only 1%, and essentially by day 28, uh, it is no longer detectable. And this has been a common theme that we've seen um, in other patients. Not only do the cells expand rapidly, they persist for long periods of time. <clears throat> 
something that we look for with our living cellular product. This is again showing you in the upper panel um, measurement for the CAR modified T cells, still representing 13 uh, percent of all the CD3 positive cells by one year. By three years, they're still detectable, 0.3 percent. By five and a half years, these cells are still detectable at 1 percent of all the CD3 positive cells. And not only are they detectable, we have very powerful circumstantial evidence that they remain biologically active. This bottom panel is looking at normal B cells. Remember, normal B cells also express CD19. We have not seen any patient have CD19 positive cells and our CAR modified cells at the same time. And you can see this patient has developed B cell aplasia persisting out to five and a half years, implying that these cells that are still surviving um, are still functional. So this is a measure of functional persistence, if you will. We've confirmed these flow cytometry numbers by PCR. These are, these are true active detectable cells. Now, <clears throat> these are those first 14 patients in our initial pilot trial, and I've just arranged the 14 patients to responders on top in yellow and non-responders on the bottom. As of yet, we have not been able to determine why some patients respond and others don't. We cannot identify any patient or disease-specific characteristics. It's not their age, their prior therapy. It's not their genetic risk profile. The only thing that seemed to track was that in patients who respond, there was a very high level of T-cell expansion over three logs for the complete responders, and the patients who didn't respond had very, very limited expansion. There's a lot of work being done trying to identify proper biomarkers that may predict which patients may or may not respond. Not only can we select the most appropriate patients to benefit, but if we can determine why somebody may or may not respond, of course, uh, we may be able to alter that in the patients who previously hadn't responded. With this dose optimization trial, at least with small numbers, there is no suggestion of a dose response effect. There were perhaps a few more responses in patients who got the higher rather than the lower dose. It was never intended to be statistically significant. It didn't seem to matter what dose we started with, and that was not completely responding. In part, I think it has more to do with how many cells you end up with rather than how many cells you put in. And so we really didn't expect to see a dramatic dose response effect. Similarly, there was no uh, dose toxicity relationship. Again, it had to do more with how many cells we ended up with and how they expanded rather than how many we put in. With this activity in a CD19 positive malignancy CLL, it was appropriate to apply this to patients with ALL. Um, Patients with relapsed or refractory ALL have an absolutely dismal prognosis. Their median survival is less than a year. Less than a quarter survive beyond three years. Transplant even is largely ineffective for these patients. We don't offer it to most patients with, with active disease. Hmm? Well, mostly, so, that, so that, um, that's for refractory disease in children. We can argue about relapse disease in children and what their, their remission length was, um, but most of these patients were very, very heavily pretreated, you'll see here. So we published this uh, at the end of 2014. This is our first 30 patients, 25 children and five adults. Um, you can see their median age. 10% were primary refractory, 73% were at least in their second relapse or beyond. So these were really advanced patients, and in fact, two-thirds had even had a prior allogeneic transplant. So this was not really your group of first relapsed ALL kids. And the outcomes were really quite astounding. 90% of these patients achieved a complete remission. There really was no precedent for this in leukemia therapy, uh, really since Gleevec was applied to CML. Um, however, there is significant toxicity, and again, I think most people have, have heard of some of this. Um, we saw very early on tumor lysis syndrome. Um, while that is a measure of toxicity, it is also a, a testament, I think, to the potency of these cells. Every patient who responded developed B-cell aplasia. Again, is that a toxicity or a measure of function? I will leave that up to you to, defi to define. We have been supporting patients with IVIG infusions. 
The most significant and unique toxicity was the cytokine release syndrome. And it took a little while to understand it and figure it out. But by the time we were treating our fourth, fifth patient, um, it became quite clear that the cytokine profiles were very abnormal in these patients. Almost all responding patients develop a cytokine release syndrome. It usually starts with low-grade fevers that escalate over several days to very high fevers, as high as 104, 105, even 106. And it will progress with nausea and eventually capillary leak with hypotension, ultimately pulmonary edema and hypoxia. Some of these patients require ICU-level care. But one of the things that became clear um, very early on is that interleukin-6 levels were dramatically elevated beyond all the other cytokines we were looking at, and we were looking at panels of 30 different cytokines. And I'm not going to show you all those different cytokines today. Interferon gamma was modestly elevated, TNF-alpha um, a little bit. Um, very little elevation in IL-2. But because IL-6 was so elevated, there, there was available anti-IL-6 therapy. There is a medication called tocilizumab, which is an anti-IL-6 receptor antibody. Um, it is known to block IL-6-mediated effects. It's FDA-approved for arthritis and juvenile arthritis. Um, Steve Grupp, in fact, treated the very first uh, child he gave T-cells with uh, who was close to death from cytokine release syndrome with tocilizumab, uh, really um, uh, when, when she was uh, actively dying on maximum ventilatory and pressor support. And we have found that anti-IL-6 therapy rapidly reverses the effects of the cytokine release syndrome. And within 30 to 60 minutes, in some cases, with several, within several hours of most. We have a good handle on, on um, how to intervene for this cytokine release syndrome. What we don't know exactly is when to intervene. There is some fear that if we uh, abrogate this response too early, we may prevent the anti-tumor response. And there's a lot of work going into trying to understand that right now. This just shows you how, how rapidly this can happen. This is a patient with 105.7 degree fever, becoming hemodynamically unstable, gets tocilizumab, and you can see rapidly becomes a febrile. It's also important to note that this is not specific to Philadelphia or the University of Pennsylvania. Similar technology and trials are being done at several other centers, including the NCI and Sloan Kettering, who have both published the results with similar outcomes, 70 to 90 percent complete remission rates. So this really seems to be a function of the therapy, not really a function of something all that unique that we're doing in Philadelphia. So I stole this from, from Richard Simon. Um, I tried to even match the color and the font, and I couldn't do it exactly. But you know, immunotherapy is different. This is a living drug that we're talking about now and that we're using. So what I tried to show you is that response rates are high. In many cases, these are durable responses. And this fills a very large unmet need. And that becomes very relevant as we think about how to design these next clinical trials. The toxicity with this living drug is unique because the cells expand. The dose administered is very different than the final dose these patients see. And the cells persist. And this drug may continue to be active for years after the initial therapy. And Every single dose is unique to that specific patient. So these are all very unique attributes of this kind of approach. Um, and um, CAR T cell therapy right now is evaluated by standard uh, criteria response, relapse free survival, survival. It's mostly been applied to patients with no other treatment options, and it may need to be assessed without comparison trials. These are not people that we can assign to phase three trials. There's nothing to compare this to. It's been extremely helpful, and I hope helpful moving forward, to, to have some help with regulatory approval. Uh, this received breakthrough designation by the FDA. Um, but since this is so novel, we have spent a lot of energy trying to educate the oversight and regulatory boards, both locally um, uh, and otherwise. The patients are unique. The toxicities are unique. The trial designs are unique. Um, other challenges. It is expensive. Uh, we were able to treat three patients in 2010. It took us over a year to secure funding for additional material to go on with this study. 
At Penn, um, I, I think we really do have a good model of an academia pharma alliance um, working very closely initially with Novartis, um, who has now licensed this, but this has been an alliance and, and co-development of this type of therapy. Um, because in part, funding for these clinical trials is on a very different scale than it is for drug development. We heard a little bit about that earlier. Um, um, I'm going to just uh, skip through, and I, I guess um, the, the other important thing, again, this is, this is novel therapy, and we found very early on that the safety and toxicity grades that we're all used to thinking of didn't apply to this type of cell therapy, and so we've had to design sort of our own novel um, toxicity grading uh, as appropriate. Now, Carl, Carl June um, gave me this slide, um, and he talks about this a lot. We tend to think about the three pillars of healthcare with pharma, biotech, and medical devices. I think we're at a time now where we have a fourth pillar because cell therapy really is going to bring in a, a whole other large group of issues um, that we're going to have to develop and define. Um, at Penn, we've now treated over 200 patients with our CAR T cells, but to do that, we essentially had to um, develop a brand new organization from scratch. This is kind of the short organizational chart that our um, uh, that someone at, uh, uh, in charge of this gave me, um, with Carl June as the director. But this is this is essentially setting up a whole company to be able to treat these 200 patients all within an academic framework. Mentioned the transfer to pharma, to Novartis. Um, Novartis is now manufacturing this in a, um, I won't say industrialized, but, but in a um, centralized manner at a plant to do T-cell manufacturing. Um, this isn't exactly everywhere they've delivered to, but um, they, they are able to provide cells both nationally and globally, which is something that an academic university and University of Pennsylvania couldn't do, um, and it has been expanded to other countries as well. Um, pharma is incredibly involved. This is a short list of, of all the different um, uh, biotech and pharma companies in this uh, uh, adoptive cellular therapy space. Um, this is something that many people are trying to operationalize uh, for large volume therapies. And so I think this is where we started. Um, we started by making one product at a time, treating a couple patients a month. A month. This was our assembly line. We're now at a, pl a, a point where this can be operationalized and standardized. But to be able to make this really practical, of course, we have to get to something like this. We have to have a smarter production so that this can treat not tens and twenties and even a few hundred patients, but thousands of patients around the world. Um, at Penn, this is our new facility uh, to uh, advance some of this. We argue that our cell production facility probably has one of the best views of any cell production facility, though we can argue that. Um, and then finally, um, I'm going to, I think we've reiterated all these summaries. The, the one thing I just wanted to highlight in concluding um, is that these cells are both personalized because every dose comes from a specific patient, and they are precise. This is precision medicine. Um, they are targeted specifically to uh, a protein on the tumor, and of course, uh, not the only one to call them precise. Uh, I am in Washington, D.C. I couldn't um, uh, avoid uh, using this slide. Um, this was uh, last year when President Obama launched the new Precision Medicine Initiative, um, giving us one of the greatest opportunities for new medical breakthroughs that we have seen, and he announced the $215 million initiative. Now, uh, again, I will leave that up to people in this room to decide, is, is that a great start and a lot of money, or is that going to be sufficient for what we're talking about here today? He is here with Emily Whitehead. This is that little girl, the very first pediatric patient to receive these T cells, now four years in complete remission uh, in school and doing wonderfully. We were all worried she missed a lot of school during her therapy. This was another day out of school. She needed an excuse. She got an excuse. Please excuse Emily from school. She was with me. So with that, um, uh, so many people involved in this at Penn, and I thank them, and a couple minutes late, but thank you very much for your attention.